Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. October the 8th, year of our Lord, 2020. We are in Matthew, lesson 230 of the Matthew series. Lesson 230 of the Matthew series. October the 8th, year of our Lord, 2020. The title is, Who Do You Say Jesus Is? Big question. Big question we're going to look at today. It's a question we should all be looking at. I think this will be a... Um, a lesson today that's actually going to be excellent for two people, actually three. It's going to be excellent for believers like you that are faithful to a, a doctrinal ministry and that want to keep learning and growing. It's going to give you some ammunition. It's going to give you some reminders. It's going to lift you up a little bit, but it's also going to give you a, um, a little bit of ammunition in the area of speaking to those believers in your periphery, people you know that claim to be Christians and yet sometimes you question because their actions and lifestyles are far removed from Christianity. It'll give you a little bit of ammunition if you ever have to get into a debate about them, about what the Bible really says about believing on Jesus Christ, who Jesus Christ is, how important it is to understand exactly who he is. So we're going to look at that today, and we're actually going to go right into a series, probably a two- or three-part series on the doctrine of the hypostatic union. I'm going to make sure you understand that completely and be able to back that up with Scripture. But also the third... Um, uh, level of this lesson, I guess we could say, is for unbelievers. If you're an unbeliever and stumbled on this page, or maybe you're a believer and you don't know how to evangelize to somebody, I'm going to give you a little bit of ammunition today. If not, take the video itself. Download the video itself. Send the link to somebody you know that's an unbeliever. This will explain a lot to them. I think this will explain a lot to them. So this is going to be great for unbelievers, for believers that give a lot of lip service to being Christians, but you're not sure they are. And for you believers that are positive believers moving forward in the plan of God that always want to gain more momentum when it comes to who and what Jesus Christ is and what real salvation is all about, how we question who Jesus is out in the world and how you can answer that question. So I think it's going to answer a lot of that today. Matthew Lesson 230, Who Do You Say Jesus Is, is the title. We are going to say some prayers today for uh, Carlene and her family. I believe her son and, and her husband need some prayer. They have some family issues going on there. Uh, Margaret, North Carolina, sent me a letter and a donation. I want to, Margaret is going through a lot of stuff in North Carolina. We'll keep Margaret and Car uh, uh, Carlene, excuse me, Margaret and Carlene in prayer today. So those are the two ones that are on my heart that I spoke to recently or sent me some messages. And speaking about messages, Sunday's message coming up may be a little unusual as I will be traveling this weekend. It's kind of a last minute thing, but we lined it up and I will teach from a different pulpit, perhaps even a living room pulpit at somebody's house. But the message should be the usual time. I'll try to do it the usual time, which I almost always get my messages up between 3 and 6, 7, between 6 and uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, usually around 3 they go up. If not, look for them around 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. Eastern time. They usually go up. So it may be from a different location Sunday, but there will be a message. We're going to get ready to jump back into Matthew chapter 16. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. In order to grow, you need to wash yourself clean, meaning get rid of the sins and the failures in your life in the area of walking outside the plan of God which means you are walking in your old nature to wash that clean, get back in the new nature to reflect Jesus Christ and have fellowship. First John 1 John 1.8 tells the believers, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In verse 10, believers, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're asking you to bless those that lift this ministry up. And Carlene and Margaret are on my, my heart. That's, they've sent some messages to me. There are family issues going on, and both of them need your healing hand. Father, we also want your healing hand on the fires. Out on the West Coast, we want your healing hand with the virus. We thank you for lifting our president and first lady up out of danger. It appears they're doing better, Father. Keep that going forward. And Father, we're asking for healing across the globe. 
whether it is a virus or it is a, a, a angry protests that are going on, Father, or tax against our, our leadership, Father. We don't want to tax against authority and police. We want a, a peaceful uh, people to be able to demonstrate and have peaceful protests, Father. And we were trying to ask and, uh, uh, that your healing hand touch all these areas and to teach us as believers in the positive pivot, the remnant that's left behind, that we can go forward and be the example and show us what to do in all these cases, Father, whether we're dealing with a virus in our family, whether we're dealing with the wildfires just around the corner, or, Father, whether we're dealing with violence in our streets or being uh, divided as a nation or divided as a world, Father, we're asking for your guidance in this area. Show us what we're supposed to do. We need to be soldiers, ambassadors for you, Father. We are royal priests. We realize that. We have to move forward in your plan and apply your word. Show us what to do, Father, through your son's Precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us jump right into it. Matthew chapter 16, again, royal family, that's where we are at. Matthew 16, 11. Let us pick it up in verse 11 in Matthew 16. How is it that you do not understand, Jesus said, that I do not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, which I told you was a form of poison, false doctrine, what is put into the word of God that is inaccurate. Matthew 16, 12, then they understood that he did not say beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. We covered this pretty well last lesson. I had some people send me messages saying they got a lot from that. So that's a, that's, that lifts me up to keep going forward when I get those positive messages. Matthew 16, 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples who... People say that the Son of Man is. Great question. That is our focus for today in verse 13, Matthew 16, 14. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. In verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? That's the question he puts back on his apostles. So this is an important question. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, which by the way, is a town named after Herod's brother, King Philip. He sets into motion a powerful question against really a powerful backdrop, I would say. This territory is named after both Philip and Caesar. That's where the name comes from. Philip is the ruler of this territory, being like his brother Herod, somewhat like a governor, you would say. Tetrarch is the word. And he is the brother whose wife Herod stole away and truthfully she willingly cheated on Philip, and Herod ended up with her and her treacherous daughter, Salome. I've taught you on that recently. I taught you about the mother-daughter deception about six months ago, the dangerous dance of Salome I covered. But this was about the only town in the area of Philip, the Tetrarch, and he called it Philip after himself, and he also called it in respect to Caesar, Caesarea. So, Caesarea of Philip... Philippi, or Philip, is the name of the town. The backdrop of the region, this region you're in, is interesting because it was ripe with some false idols and gods or temples, settings designed, really, to worship other gods and false gods. So there were temples and settings and architectural designs there in the backdrop when Jesus got to this area that shows false gods and, fall, and, 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 and false idols. And it's interesting that he chose this backdrop with the worship of false gods and idols there. Caesarea Philippi, the area we're looking at here, was associated with idols and rival deities within it. There was one altar set up to the ancient Syrian Baal worship. We know about Baal, or Baal, some people pronounce it. And a cavern set in a hillside that was said to be the birthplace of the god of nature, Pan. I don't know if you ever study all your Greek gods. That's supposedly the god of nature which was also considered a holy place, a holy cavern. People treated as a holy place. They might have went there to worship as well. Also, in Caesarea Philippi, there was the great temple of white marble built to the godhead of Caesar. So you're seeing a lot of false gods and foreign idols here, and that's the backdrop that Jesus is going to ask this important question in, and it fits, it fits very accurately to our study today. Now, in this backdrop, and with the lesson of leaven by the religious crowd in their minds, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ wants to ask the most important question all mankind needs to answer for themselves. So think about it. Now with this backdrop I'm showing you, and with the lesson of leaven fresh in their mind by the religious crowds, 
you know, the poison of the false doctrines, and now you have false idols and false gods. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ wants to most ask that most important question all mankind needs to answer. Who do you believe Jesus Christ is? That's the most important question, folks. And this is the backdrop you're looking at. I find this very interesting. There's a lot that goes into this when I studied it and looked at it. He asked his disciples, basically saying, who do the men say that the Son of Man is? Who do you guys believe? Who are people talking about the Son of Man is? Who am I to you? And what is everybody saying? This is a question of identification here, folks. Cutting right to the marrow of the issue, and this goes to every believer today. Very important question. Get right down to it. Who do you believe Jesus is? Who do you believe those people around you when they say Jesus Christ? Who do they believe he is? Who do you believe he is? This question is so, so important, um, and a lot of people gloss over something like this. Very, very important. A lot of people say, yeah, well, he's the Savior. He's Jesus Christ. He's the one who wrote the Bible. And they shoot off a lot of quick answers. Do they really understand what Jesus is saying and who he really is? He has identified for them that the doctrine of the scribes and Pharisees is leaven. Sadducees, scribes, and Pharisees, what do they teach? Leaven. They teach evil, a poison added into the Word of God. And now you have a backdrop of false gods and foreign idols. Now he asks, who do men say that I am? Because we need to get away from all this leaven, the lies and the falsehoods and the counterfeits and the false gods. Who am I to you? Son of man was a title the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ often used to identify with his own humanity. That's why he used that term, Son of Man, identifying with humanity, meaning he is the bloodline of the true royalty concerning the prophecies of King David. He's the mediator between man and God because he is both. We will see that in future lessons. And he fulfills the humanity aspect of the Messiah in Scripture. So he relates to his humanity, we say, when he says the Son of Man. Now, there is a backdrop and a depth to this that you don't want to just overlook, as I said, and gloss over it. It's very dramatic in the sense that the apostles are aware of their surroundings. They know where they're at. They can look around and see what's going on. They know their history and they know the area they're in. They are awake also to the leaven now of the religion, the religion they've been exposed to their whole life. And the Lord is shaking them to really view the doctrine of the hypostatic union, which we're going to get into probably in the next lesson. Matthew 16, 14, and they said, Some say, you're John the Baptist, Lord, and others say Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or maybe one of the prophets, they say to him. All three men were, were what we would say, controversial prophets who stood boldly against the wave of apostate believers and corrupt government, corrupt leadership. So this is actually a pretty good call that some people said that, but they're still off the mark. Each of these men were attacked by the powers of leadership over them and faced adversity even from the Jews who were supposed to be their brethren. So it is accurate. It's a good analogy, I guess you could say. The analogy is good, but you can never take any human being, even a biblical hero like one of these great men, these great men of God, and think they compare to the unique one of the universe, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You cannot do it. All three of these prophets mentioned were thought to be coming back at some historic point, believe it or not. There was a lot of Jews that believed all three of these men were going to come back in one way, shape, or form. Truthfully, the two supernatural witnesses mentioned in Revelation chapter 11 that do come back are probably going to be Moses and Elijah, but even they are no comparison to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So yes, is it a good analogy? Yeah, on the surface, but we want to get a little bit deeper. There's nobody that compares to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a very powerful question, a very heavy question set in an interesting backdrop. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ needs to affirm that 11 of the apostles, he knows about Judas in his heart, he needs to affirm the 11 apostles who he knows will establish the church age are clear on who he is and the depth of importance of never misinterpreting that truth. Never clouding that issue. Never distorting that truth of who he is. Matthew 16, 15, he said, But who do you say that I am? He kind of hits them one after the other. Very heavy questions, very serious manner with this backdrop behind him. This becomes very personal, folks. And the Lord is really bringing this question to its full extent. You can see he's pushing it and placing it directly upon the apostle's lap, we would say. And Peter, who is in a 
position of leadership role is going to take the mantle on this one and probably see it in our next lesson. But he's placing it on all the apostles right now. A pretty heavy set of questions are going to them. Go back into the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 7, royal family. Go to Isaiah chapter 7. I want to paint you a picture of there are times when the Lord stopped them in a certain area or certain situation and dropped something very heavy on them and really looked, in, it looked into their soul, we would say, and wanted to see where they were at and get the right answer from them. This is one of those times. Each believer, all of us, each believer must take responsibility for what they believe. All of us. If you truly believe the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is God, is the only Savior, is what the Bible says He is, then there can be no cherry-picking of the Bible and changing Bible doctrine to fit your, des your desires or your lifestyle. Understand that. There is no way to truly have this belief that Jesus is all of these things I'm telling you and the Bible says and walk around in a world as if you belong in this world. Let me say that again. Each believer, all of us, every believer, whether it was them back then who Jesus was talking to the 12 apostles, obviously focused on the 11 more so than everybody else, but each believer must take responsibility for what they believe. If you truly believe the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is God, is the only Savior, is what the Bible says He is, then there can be no cherry-picking of your Bible, folks, and picking out this and that, and I'll believe this, but I don't believe that, and changing Bible doctrine to fit your personal desires. There is no way to truly have this belief I'm telling you and walk around in this world as if you belong here. It just simply doesn't line up, folks. The backdrop of the world we live in in the year of our Lord 2020, think about it, is littered with false idols and gods. That's a backdrop... That's very dramatic as well, just as dramatic as the day of our Lord talking to these men in Matthew chapter 16. What do we have today? I could, I could put the list on the next five slides. I put a few here just to tickle your, your memory here to think about what's going on all around you each and every day. Media stars, athletes, addictions, sexual perversions, lust-filled distractions, wealth, power, corruption on many, many levels all around us. All distractions, all part of the false gods and false idols, we would say. In all the distractions and false gods of this world, many people, believers included, many people, believers included, do not understand the depth and width of who Jesus Christ really is. It's a big problem, folks. It's bigger than you think. That's why this lesson is so very important. Again, this lesson is great for unbelievers, obviously, but for believers who I say are on the fence that have said, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't think they fully digest who and what Jesus Christ is and what their Bible is all about. And it's great for those Christians that need a reminder. So I don't care if we're talking about anybody in this world, believers or not. They do not understand that the, many don't. And I'm saying many that hear my voice today probably do. But there are some that maybe hear my voice today or stumble on this message later on that do not understand the depth and width of who Jesus Christ is. So what, what happens in the world? So they have blended him in really into a human mess that fits their own desires and comfort zone. That's what we have in the year of our Lord 2020. Believe me, it started back then in the day of the apostles, but that's what we have today. What we really have today is a version of Jesus or several different versions of Jesus Christ that are so watered down and they're fit into this human mess we call our world all around us because they want to be fitted into people who have their own lifestyles, their own comfort zone, their own desires, and they want to fit Jesus into that. It's a big problem, folks. And there's a reason God, the Holy Spirit, is leading me to teach this. Obviously, some people need to hear this, certainly today of our, our, our Lord, year of our Lord, 2020. Some people this might think I'm dropping guilt. I am not. But this is a victory for Satan. What you're reading on the slides and what you're hearing right now, this is really a victory for Satan, and it shouldn't be. Look at what the prophets teaches, uh, uh, Isaiah teaches, chapter 7, verse 13. Go to Isaiah 7, 13. King Hosea is called out by God as he is preparing for war, and here is what's revealed to him. Because he was the head of the tribe of Judah at this historic point, God gives him a prophetic statement concerning the tribe of Judah. Look what Isaiah writes here in uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 13. Isaiah 7, 13. 
Then he said, listen now, O house of David. This is the word of God coming down to this king. Maybe it's sp spoken through Isaiah, but it's God the Holy Spirit working through him. And it's God speaking. Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight of a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my God as well? Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. In other words, I'm going to talk to you about a prophetic thing that's going to happen. And as all prophecy has already happened, it will happen. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel. 700 years before the birth, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. The Hebrew title of Emmanuel, with us is God, is really what it means, was placed on that supernatural event. 700 years prior to. Who is Jesus Christ? With us is God. That's one of your answers right there. We can never conflate the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with Old Testament prophets and teachers and men like Moses and Elijah or any of them, the great men, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Yes, they were great, but don't conflate Jesus Christ with these kind of prophets. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is God. Do not be mistaken. He is the divine Savior of the world, the creator of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega. The value of having the right information Listen to me carefully. The value of having the right information, more importantly, the right belief in who and what your future hinges upon is the most valuable mental asset you have within your soul structure. I'll say that again to hammer it home. The value of having the right information, accurate teaching, accurate information, and more importantly, the right belief in who and what your future hinges on really think about it, is the most valuable mental asset you have within your soul structure. It really is. It's more valuable than we realize. The question about who you believe Jesus Christ to be, then, is the most important question in a person's life, bar none. That's the most important question, bar none. Who do you believe Jesus Christ to be? Even the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ asked this question out loud to the religious crowds just as much as he asked it to his apostles, like we see in Matthew 16. He's asked it several times in Scripture. Matthew 22, 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. And he asked this out loud so the crowds could hear this. In verse 42, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? He's testing them. They said to him, the son of David. They know their Scriptures to some degree. These religious men spoke about the humanity, the bloodline, in the humanity of the Messiah, and we're still really not recognizing that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, the only Savior. If you understand that chapter, you understand what was going on here. They weren't believing necessarily. They were just reciting the fact that the bloodline of the Messiah comes through David, the humanity. There is a level of divine sarcasm written in Matthew chapter 20, uh, 22, excuse me, that's on the board that we will eventually get around to studying, not right now. But the question remains the same. What do you think about the Messiah? What do you think about Jesus Christ? Who do you think it is? What do you think it what do you think he did? What does he represent to you? The one question, that one question determines where you spend eternity, folks. That one question. There's no other question for each of us individually more important than that. There's none. When you think about it, I was putting the notes together. This really stuck out to me. That's why I needed to hammer this home. There is no other question. For each of us individually, every human being on this earth, everybody that was born since the, since the garden and that will be born into the millennial reign. There is no other question for each of us individually more important than that. No marriage questions, no career questions, no money questions, no health questions. None more important. None. Think about that. The question cuts to the core of what people truly believe. It cuts right through the nonsense. There are believers, folks, who say they believe in Jesus Christ. You may have them in your periphery. I don't know. And you're not to judge them. I'm just telling you. We all bump into people. And some of us were like this at one point. But there are believers who say they believe in Jesus Christ. And they say, yeah, I'm a Christian. They check the box. And yet they will say, and you'll hear them say, and they'll agree, if someone is good enough, they can get into heaven without the accuracy of the question coming into light who Jesus Christ is. You'll see it. I'm sure you, many of you have heard it. And I'm sure it makes some of your hearts sad now that you fully understand. And similarly, 
Some believers will say you can lose your salvation if you're bad enough, which goes to show you they don't know who Jesus Christ is. They don't know their Bible. Both answers are woefully inaccurate. The accuracy of how you answer that question and truly believe in your answer dictates your whole life in eternity. Think about that, the importance of this question. The accuracy of how you answer that question and what you truly believe when you answer that question, and that answer dictates your whole life in all of eternity, everything. Don't tell me it's not important. It is. Because if you answer that halfway, you half-stepping, as they say, halfway, and you say, well, Jesus is kind of like God. That he was special. He's a super superior human being, supernatural being, and you have you have to dance around with all kinds of answers. He was or he is a son of God, but not equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit. That's basically what you're saying. That you do not believe in who and what the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ truly is and always will be. Everything he's done, who he is. You don't truly believe. Isaiah 9, 6 is for what? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government, meaning the world systems, will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Jesus Christ, Mighty God, Jesus Christ, Eternal Father, Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace. Those are some of his titles from the Old Testament. Jesus Christ. Every prophecy written about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, tells us He is the Chosen One of the universe, the Savior, the Mediator, the High Priest, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and the God of Heaven and Earth. You should be able to answer that question. Who is Jesus? What say you of Jesus Christ? You should be able to answer that question. And there are people in your periphery that claim to be Christians and say, yeah, I know about Jesus. Do they really? That's not up to you to judge. But maybe it's up to you to take some of these scriptures and a lesson like this and sit them down and let them see this. Or give that to them when you get an opportunity. Or bring it up in conversation. Be prepared. And maybe you're an unbeliever who stumbled on this page. And today's the day you do believe and realize who Jesus Christ is. And that important question hits home for you. Turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7 with me. New Testament book of John chapter 7. Gospel of John. Sorry about that. Chapter 7. Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, somebody in his line, it says, and he will reign as king, Jesus Christ, and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land, verse 6. And in his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely and this is his name by which we would call the Lord our righteousness. Future tense here. Prophetic. Prophecy pointing us to what? Thousand year millennial reign. Second advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What is he called? The Lord of our righteousness. Look at the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Galilee in the Gospel of John. Avoiding, really, the Feast of the Boots, they would say, because the Jews were already seeking to physically attack him at this point. I think he was about 16 or 18 months into his ministry. And his own brothers are not believing in him. Pretty incredible. Remember, some of, some of his own family members, you know, other than obviously Mary and Joseph, you know, we know Joseph passed away at some point in Jesus' adult life. But remember, some members of his own family and friends, circle of friends, people he grew up with, did not believe in him until after his resurrection. John 7, 11. Pick it up in verse 11. John 7, 11. So the Jews were seeking him at the feast and were saying, where is he? And they're not seeking him for a good reason. They want to play more word games with him. They want to verbally attack him and physically get rid of him really at this point as well. John 7, 12. There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him, Jesus. Some were saying he is a good man. That's what they believed. What do you believe? Others are saying, no, on the contrary, he leads people astray. In other words, he's kind of evil. Notice how everybody has a different opinion about Jesus. That it was way back then, and it is today too. Notice who they think Jesus Christ is. John 7, 13, yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now listen, in this chapter uh, 7, I could get into a lot of different doctrinal principles. 
my calling in this is to look at the different things that people said about him and how split and divided it was when he was walking among them. Now we have it in our day and age where he's been far removed from us, not walking among us physically. What do you think people think today? John 7, 14, when it, when it was now the midst of the feast, in other words, the days are going by, Jesus finally goes up to the temple, begins to teach. John 7, 15, the Jews then were astonished, saying, how has this man become learned having never been educated. In other words, I always told you he was a carpenter, but if you understood what a carpenter was, and at age 30-some-odd years old, or 30 years old, Jesus, when he used the term carpenter in the Greek, oftentimes it meant a laborer. So Jesus was a physical laborer, would have been a physical guy. He would have been some guy you pick off a construction site and said, yeah, this is a laborer. He works on a carpentry site. It didn't necessarily mean he was a great craftsman. The word was very loosely, uh, loosely used. Not to say he wasn't. I'm just saying. This is why they're saying he's never really been educated. It's like pulling a construction guy off the site. John 7, 16. So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me, meaning I come from the heavenly, verse 17, if anyone is willing to do his will, God, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He's letting him know, I'm not even from here. <laughs> I'm from somewhere else, fellas. There's a lot of times Jesus hinted around about things in his humanity that let people know, listen, I am God. I'm, I, am, uh, this is, I am the one that brings the message. I am the Messiah. I'm the one you're looking for. And yet they continue to reject him, mostly the Jews. Jesus is speaking from his humanity here, yet he is telling them the words he teaches come directly from God the Father. Who else could do that? His contact with God the Father, even in his humanity, is directly from the throne room of heaven, folks, because he is God. The more Jesus speaks, the more crowd gets riled up, you'll see, because legalism has seized the majority in that day. We've studied this, the leaven of legalism and religion took over that crowd, most of them anyway, certainly the Jewish leadership. Religion is the ultimate blinding agent, folks. Religion is the ultimate blinding agent, even when truth and God is standing directly in front of you. Now jump down a few verses to verse 28. John 7, 28, I'll put it on the board. Again, like I said, we're not starting the whole chapter. I'm showing you some principles here, how divided people were about who Jesus Christ really is. Then Jesus cried out in the temple, teaching and saying, You both know me and know where I am from, and I have not come of myself. In other words, you know your Torah, you know your scriptures, you know who you're dealing with. You know where I've come, not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know, because you are following the wrong type of system, man-made religion. Verse 29, I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. His birth, Jesus Christ's birth, his appearance, all he represented was the triune God that the majority of the Jews struggle to grasp because of religion. That's why they do not know him. Religion. Some of that leaven in that lump of dough we've recently studied. This is what happens when you do not understand who God is. And you are fooled by religion and cosmic viewpoint. And many walk around fooled by religion and cosmic viewpoint. They wanted to seize him, if you read on. Yet some of the crowd began to believe that this was the Messiah. Notice the division. Who do you say Christ is? Boy, they, you had one group starting to believe, another group trying to seize and get rid of him. Look at verse 32. John 7, 32. Jump down. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to seize him. They had uh, what you would say... Um, from the Sanhedrin, they had their own little police force that they sent out. John 7, 33, Therefore Jesus said, For I a little, for I will a while little, <laughs> Jesus therefore said, For a little while longer I am with you. Excuse me. I get excited about these principles, phenomenal principles. Then I go to him who sent me. So he's letting him know, I'm here. The cross is coming. And I'm going to be gone. I will send a helper. He'll get into that in a little bit. You'll see the, the hints and the, and the uh, doctrine leading up to the the filling of the Holy Spirit that he's going to talk about. Therefore, Jesus said, For a little while longer I am with you, then I will go to him who sent me. Verse 34, You will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come, because you're unbelievers. 
because heaven is reserved only for the righteous. And those with the righteousness of Christ can enter. All others shall never enter into the divine gate of heaven without the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He's letting him know, I can go through heaven. You cannot. Without me, you cannot. And most of them would reject. But there were some believing there. John 7, 35. The Jews then said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He is not intending to go to the dis uh, dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? That's their big concern. They're not concerned with who Jesus is, the big question. Just what he's teaching might confuse their loyal followers. They have the truth, not God. Now, excuse me, on the last day of tabernacles or the Feast of Boots, whatever you choose to call it, it is the eighth day, and our Lord has been preaching and teaching, and it's coming up to the Sabbath now. And this is written in the Greek present tense. The Greek present tense. So the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was repeatedly teaching these same principles over and over again. John 7, 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. He's probably exhausted at this point in his humanity, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, he's reaching into Old Testament just to make sure that the scribes and Pharisees can hear this as well, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water if you come to me, he's saying. He who believes in me, as it is in Scripture. In other words, I am the one you've been waiting for. I am the Messiah. If, if is a Greek third-class condition, meaning it is possible. If, and maybe it's possible, you can go in either direction. Your free will matters in this decision. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Your decision. You have to come to Him. You have to come to Christ in the sense you have to recognize and answer that question, who is Jesus Christ? The rivers of living waters, you see, are written to point out eternal life, folks. That's what it means, always living and flowing, never to die, always fresh always renewing also a reference to the filling power of God, the Holy Spirit, soon to descend upon that church age believers. This is a statement of deity that he is the only one who can offer this because he is God and his spirit is of God, the triune God. Only eternal security and power from God, the Holy Spirit, comes from the triune God. John seven thirty nine. But this he spoke of the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because what? Jesus was not yet glorified, mission not complete, until the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. John seven forty. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard those words, were saying, this certainly is what? The prophet. No matter what he was teaching, and he was habitually teaching it over and over again, for the better part of eight days, <laughs> This is, the, this is a prophet. Many to this very day say Jesus was just a prophet. Many to this very day. And some claim to be Christians, and they still think he's some kind of a special supernatural prophet. John 7, 41. Others were saying this is the Christ, the Messiah. Still others were saying, surely, the Christ, the Messiah, is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Little do they know. John 7, 42, has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the descendants of David, the bloodline of David, and from Bethlehem, the village where David was, the big question, verse 43, so a division occurred in the crowd because of him, and to this very day we have divisions in the crowd because people don't know how to answer that question, who is Jesus Christ, and know the accuracy of the information. Remember, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ happened where? In Bethlehem. The virgin birth happened in Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph stayed there for several weeks after the birth of Jesus. He fulfills scripture to the letter. This lines up with what the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught his followers, though. That I came to bring a sword, not peace. Remember that lesson? Truth of the word, the sword, causes separation only because some will say, Jesus was a prophet. He was a divine, supernatural being. He was a good man. And others will acknowledge the truth of who the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be. And it will be a divided camp, unfortunately. 
those who reject him now will eventually bow down to him later. Whether you hear this message and believe that or not, it's not up to me. I'm nothing in the plan of God. I'm just a little mouthpiece in the plan of God. Those who reject him now will eventually bow down to him later. Everybody will. Philippians 2.9 For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Verse 10 So that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Look at that. What kind of being do you need to be to have everyone bow at the mention of your name in the heavenly, on the earth, under the earth? meaning those in captivity under the earth. Believers or unbelievers. There will come a time, folks, when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, and it's called the great genuflex. Many of you have heard of it. Here it is. Genesis, oh, excuse me, Genesis. Genuflex. Philippians 2.11, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue, bar none, if you have never come to really believe that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, today's your calling. Now is your time. Faith alone in Christ alone. No other time. Do it now. Faith alone in Christ alone. God came in the flesh. He is Jesus Christ, God of the universe. Never doubt that. John 10, 30 says, I and the Father are one. Jesus made bold statements like that. I and the Father are one, no difference. John 17, 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, verse 21, that they may all be one. He's praying, speaking to the Father. Even as you, Father, are in me, I in you, we are one, we are in union, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Divine union we have with Christ. Divine union we have with the triune God. They're all in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One and the same yet separate beings able to operate independently yet our one Godhead. There is never a question as to who Jesus Christ is. There shouldn't be. Who he was, who he'll be forever and ever and always will be, always was. The only question comes down to what the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ asked the apostles in Matthew chapter 16. That's the big question for all of us. In John 5, 18, for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he kept claiming he was God in more ways than one because he not only was breaking the Sabbath but also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God, which he did habitually. His teaching all pointed to that. In the ancient world, it was often viewed that the Father, historically, in the ancient times, during these times, it was often viewed that the Father and the first Son were really one and the same. It meant that the firstborn Son and the Father were similar and very identical to the point of every trait. Their bloodline, their blessings, their property was passed on from that Father to that firstborn Son. So it had a greater meaning, historically, to be the son of somebody, the firstborn. And as I read to you at the beginning of every message, folks, to emphasize the importance of the word, because it is the mind of Christ, which means God's thoughts. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was what? The word was God. And then what does John say in verse 14? And the word was that was God, became flesh, and dwelt among us. We saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Old Testament, when Moses asked God, who do I tell these Egyptians and this Egyptian Pharaoh you are? Who sent me? What do I say to them? What did he say to Moses? God said, I am. Two words, I am was the definitive answer, meaning always was, always will be, Moses. Tell him, I am sent you. John 8, 57, so the Jews said to him, you are not even yet 50 years old, Jesus, and have you seen Abraham? 
And Jesus said to them in verse 28, Truly, truly, verily, verily, our main, our main, pay attention, pay attention, important. I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Do you believe that? Does that answer your question? Who is Jesus Christ to you? Who is Jesus Christ to me? Ignore the uh, GoFundMe on the bottom. I'm sorry I had to put this message together. I'm getting ready to hit the road and uh, take a uh, long weekend off. Sunday I'll be putting my message up. It will not be in this studio, but uh, I appreciate your time. This was a, a lesson to make you think when you hear that question, who is Jesus Christ? And you hear people say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I know about Jesus. Do you really? Who do you believe him to be? Who is Christ to you? Very important question. The most important question. The heaviest question that you can have. And the heaviest question that Jesus Christ puts on his apostles as they step off into that town and look off into the area and see the different false gods and foreign idols. And he's saying, there's always these false gods and foreign idols, this leaven and lies all around. Who am I in the midst of all this? Don't lose sight of that. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time. Bless those that take these messages out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.